Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on the 28th episode of Long Story Short, organized by BSN Network. Today, we are joining us on our panel, Matthew Keller, Bill Kentner, and Stephen Haft to discuss the impact of blockchain and crypto projects on environment. And I will just give the opportunity to our speakers to present themselves. Please, starting with you, Mr. Matthew. Sure. My name is Matt Keller. <clears throat> I run the Impact and Inclusion Vertical for the Algorand Foundation. Uh, we are a um, pure proof of stake protocol incorporated. Uh, the Inc. is incorporated in Boston, Massachusetts, the foundation in Singapore. My background generally is humanitarian. I was with the United Nations World Food Program. Um, I led the Global Learning X Prize for a number of years uh, and some other technology and development projects. And then half my career was spent in Washington lobbying on campaign finance reform, open and accountable government, and access to voting. So kind of a bifurcated past. That's an amazing background. Mr. Bill? So I'm Bill Kentrup, co-founder of All Infra. All Infra is a blockchain-based technology and solutions platform providing tools for environmental finance, um, using technology for for green bonds, for verification of impact related to finance. And my background is for over 22 years in environmental finance. So much of that was actually taking place in China. I was based in Hong Kong during that time, uh, financing renewable energy, energy efficiency, waste management projects, and helping those projects realize benefit through carbon credits and renewable certificates. Um, so, you know, that at one point for a multinational for eight years for a bank, so really sort of traditional environmental finance. And then in the recent years, really getting deep into the tech side of things and, and, and importantly, I guess, using tech to accelerate green finance. And we can talk a bit about how blockchain is actually playing a role in driving environmental finance. Amazing. Mr. Steven. Um, I'm Stephen Haft. Um, I have the privilege of working on partnerships for consensus. I also lead our work in the climate space. My background is pretty extensive in uh, media and technology, spent a number of years in and out of various parts of Time Warner, going back to when it was AOL Time Warner, and uh, prior to that uh, was a filmmaker. Um, I started my career as an environmental advocate and, um, and and human rights lawyer, so I guess I consider myself a bit of a, an OG in the space. That sounds fabulous. I guess all of uh, our guests today are the best in their fields, and they have committed their careers to the uh, impact of uh, pretty much different industries on the environment and they are very big advocates. So I guess we're in very safe hands when it comes to discussing this topic. So I'm very excited about this actually. So I'm just gonna lay down a little bit of background about our topic and uh, kick in with the, the, the fact that the energy intensive consensus mechanism that the Bitcoin technology or Bitcoin blockchain is using is known as the proof of work for those who don't know, which uses up an incredible amount of energy. A study by Joule found that Bitcoin mining worldwide might be responsible for about 65 megatons of carbon dioxide a year, comparable to the emissions of Greece. A single Bitcoin transaction you, uh, now requires more than 2,000 kilowatts per hour of electricity. Actually, it's enough energy to power the average American household for 73 days. Wow. Using clear renewable energy for mining is essential for sustainable development of human society. It has also led the blockchain industry to examine more efficient and aligned mechanisms to tackle ex excessive energy consumption. Can alternate consensus mechanism be a solution to this problem? And how can blockchain technology help environmental protection and contribute to ecological sustainability? These are the questions that we are trying to tackle in today's discussion with our experts. And uh, hopefully we can have a better understanding by the end of it and have like a grasp about what's the difference between these consensus mechanisms and the different implementations of blockchain, because there is not just proof of work or proof of stake, obviously. And how can we improve in general, the whole landscape of using this very novel and efficient technology? 
So first article mentioned by the Economic uh, Times, published this April actually, says that Bitcoin production is estimated to generate between 22 and 22.9 million metric tons of carbon dioxide a year, equivalent to about 1% of global electricity consumption. What's your perspective on making blockchain technology more environmentally friendly? Well, I, it, I'll, I'll take I'll take a piece of that, um, and, and with hats off also to my uh, uh, Algorand uh, colleague. Um, uh, alternate consensus mechanisms have proven that they can address the uh, excessive electrical consumption of of proof of work based systems like. Bitcoin. I mean, we are now days away from Ethereum, uh, which is the protocol that I mainly uh, work in relationship to. I think, I think that's probably fairly similar for for Bill Kentrip as well. Uh, but but Ethereum is about to become indeed uh, the first. I believe the first. I mean, I, I'd be happy to hear that as this broadcast goes out people write in and say, I, I, I'm wrong because the, I, I'd like to hear that there are 50 other examples, but I don't think there are. I think this uh, Ethereum will become the first technology or line of business that has managed through innovation with no financial tricks, no offsets, through in purely innovation, changing its consensus mechanism to drop over 99%. I I think we're at 99 and to the fifth digit percent of its electrical consumption overnight due to uh, an innovation. Uh, if auto could do it, if cement could do it, if real estate could do it, if consumer packaged goods could do it, they hopefully would do it. I don't know. Maybe they wouldn't, but they hopefully would do it. We have done it and we are literally days away, I think, from having been quite honestly, uh, 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 on the wrong end of this to get here, uh, going through uh, a, a remarkable uh, uh, growth as a proof of work based protocol to get to this point. But from this point forward, I think we have the opportunity to become leaders and showing uh, uh, not only our colleagues in and around crypto, but indeed other industries and lines of business globally um, that it can be done and setting perhaps a new North Star for what's possible. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if kind of to Steve's point, Stephen's point is that if, if you know, Bitcoin from the get-go or if Algorand had been the first, the pure proof of stake protocol, nobody, <laughs> nobody would be changing, right? Nobody would be thinking uh, we, we have to do something different. But the fact that you know, it is out there, you know, Algorand was obviously an innovator in the space and then Ethereum is moving away from that, what is really kind of a, an unacceptable rate of, of carbon emission and energy consumption. And, and, you know, Steve, looking at your background on Earth Day and probably involved somehow in the passage of maybe clean air, clean water, whatever it was in the early 70s, you know, you- That's right. <laughs> you more than probably anybody I've talked, I've never, never, never met you, but anybody I've talked to in this space kind of like deeply gets that, right? It sounds like, by the way, as you were describing your background, you were at Common Cause. Were you at- Yeah, I was. You working? Yeah, because when I hear you describe, I, I'm sorry, we're having a departure here, just <laughs> like meeting virtually, <laughs> but but when you, when you run down the campaign finance reform, et cetera, et cetera, I hear John Gardner. Oh yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I was. I, uh, I, I know your background, and it's uh, it, it's uh, your your days in Washington. It seems to me um, now will be called upon yet again as our entire space has the opportunity to go from laggards to leaders in this conversation. Yeah, there's no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. I would um, maybe just to comment on the you know areas where using proof of work you know, has a role to play in in sort of environmental improvement. And I guess, you know, in my career, I've been financing renewable energy developers. Uh, about five of our shareholders are in the renewable energy development space. And one of the challenges in developing renewable energy is 
now planning around uh, demand and you know you've got good renewable resources and as you're developing and planning sites what what's the demand can i dispatch that power to the grid and there is a niche and and it's not an insignificant niche it's quite large where in china for example you've got renewable assets with great resources but they're in areas where all that power or significant amount can't get dispatched to the grid and so we're starting to see some coordination better coordination and planning amongst developers of you know not in china per se but in other markets mining capacity and renewable energy planning so there is a role and a nice stabilizing role that mining can play in the right circumstances so it's not i guess you know in a sense all negative it actually strengthens certain areas of the renewable energy industry so just i think it's worth noting that as well yeah I do agree with you to some extent because I feel like if, for example, blockchain itself or the first distributed ledger came uh, without having proof of work, it would have been very hard to sell to the general public because in concept, blockchain in general is still very hard to grasp by most of the people, like to the majority. But Mm. at least having an underlying uh, energy or something that has value that kind of powers the whole chain or network beside the network effect of people itself kind of gives it that push the first and as uh, Stephen mentioned like the transition is something like that is imminent and we can see that like the leading projects like for example Ethereum transitioning from proof of work to proof of stake which is going to be an immense or big uh, effort like which is done by a lot of contributors or parts of the community itself. So I guess that's still kind of amazing to have all of these players all around the world making that transition within like still less than a decade in an ecosystem. Well, also to is, think so, about yeah. the scale of it, Adam. Um, uh, I mean, I, 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 I've read this, I didn't run these numbers and I'm talking to uh, a guy across there, Matt, who's uh, rooted in, Cambridge, Silvio Macaulay, MIT, you know, they do their own original science. So I'm a little embarrassed, but, but I've read that Ethereum at 11 trillion uh, transactions last year uh, on the system actually is, was, that was, that's more transactions than were conducted on Visa last year. So to give a, a, a comparison of the scale, it's not just a, a kind of uh, obscure new startup tech off to the side. It is it is a, uh, a, 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 a global technology operating at remarkable scale that is about to undergo this, uh, this cha- a, a change of this magnitude. I think that, you know, to, to Adam, your point, it's the relative obscurity um, in, in some cases, in some ways that's true, but I think one of our jobs is to, you know, look at the use cases, particularly around environmental sustainability and kind of social impact. And what is it that, you know, we're funding, what are, you know, Bill, what are you investing in, in the clean energy space mm. where blockchain is a key component, but for the existence of blockchain, we couldn't actually trace and verify organic goods, or we couldn't understand the provenance of green molecules, or, you know, Mm -hmm. we're investing in in, um, Planet Watch, which has sensors that trace air pollutants, and that gives policymakers the ability to kind of craft policy at a micro level. And all these, you know, disaster relief, all these things that are going to, the more that we invest, the more that we show the world the power of what this can do in terms of sustainability and impact, the more people just by having it in the zeitgeist are going to understand its value. And I think that's, that's part of this conversation for sure. Yeah. You know, just to echo that, um, you know, in in the Kyoto markets, which was the precursor to Paris agreements, um, the, the process for getting data out of assets to be able to verify and prove you've reduced emissions um, and even still, to some extent today, was an entirely manual process, a process of visiting sites, pulling data from devices on site, writing reports, submitting reports. And, you know, we were doing that sort of work for 
20, 30, 40 projects a year, um, many of those in China. And this could take anywhere from four to eight or 12 months just for one issuance, one issuance of carbon credits. And what you've got at the end of that is one static uh, issuance, a report that relates to that. Now putting that um, process on digital rails, taking that data collection, doing it remotely. COVID, of course, with you know, really restricting people's ability to get to site has really underlined the power of this as well. Being able to extract data directly from assets, putting that data directly into product, into carbon credits, into renewable certificates, you're not only creating a better product that's data rich, you're getting that in this really unbroken form from a device on a site into the product that, mm -hmm. that reduces double counting. It reduces cost to minutes as opposed to six or eight months. And it all, you know, and, and the ultimate effect of that is really accelerating climate finance. The most from, you know, lots of, reasons that Kyoto didn't get extended after 2012, it was supposed to, but the most commonly cited in terms of, you know, just from what I've seen over time, is that the pain and cost and unpredictability of doing that data collection and verification to finally get your valuable product was, was just too painful. And so many industries pushed back and, and, and it was very unfortunate, but here we are, we're, you know, we're able to now make that a much more predictable efficient process with better product right that sounds amazing it sounds overall that blockchain technology or the distributed ledger has brought more efficiency to almost different industries including the supply chain or like uh, tracking uh di dioxide uh, emissions in general so that's good so well, and, even, and even like, you know, the, the, if the effects of climate change, which is happening at an in, incredible rate, just out, you know, hurricanes and floods and, and droughts. And, and then you think about the mitigating effects that blockchain can play in terms of survivors who are, which, and Bill, to your point, it, FEMA, and still, it's still a paper process. And mm -hmm. so people who are kind of suffering through these in, increasingly uh difficult events are waiting a long time to get any kind of disaster relief and so not only can it play a role in kind of in in reducing emissions and etc but can also play a role in mitigating against the worst effects of climate change which are the human effects people suffering as a result of what's happening you know to the earth and its environment so it, it plays a role there just i just wanted to throw that in mm -hmm. there because that that's a, that could be a novel use of that technology in the coming months <clears throat> And Matt's re and, and 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 Matt, I think, highlights the urgency of the moment, and the urgency of the moment is um, is now, uh, I think, bringing into sharp focus the need to throw tremendous amounts of resources against this uh, climate emergency. And the fact is that real-time data now providing, being provided to the dashboards of financiers and not just regulators uh, makes possible, it seems to me, the opportunity to, oh, you know, genuinely open the spigot in, uh, in, in, a, in a financially uh, advantageous way for new money to enter the system and uh, maybe begin to fill the gaps and meet the urgency of the moment. Don't you, don't you feel, Bill, you're working on a, on a uh, digital MRV project for the Bank of International Settlement, which, whose, whole, um, which, whose goal is to create that new model to open up new financing in the space. Yeah, <clears throat> that's right. Um... It's it's a project actually originated out of Hong Kong, so not you know not too far from uh, where you are, Adam. And um, uh, the it was initiated by Bank of International Settlements. Um, the UNFCCC managing Paris agreements is now a key party to that initiative. And basically, what it is is taking the concept of a green bond and wrapping that green bond in a tradable digital instrument. So making that financing, that climate financing available to a wider audience, 
having it in a very efficient format that's that's tradable or listable. But then importantly on the on the data side, the the history of green bonds, you know, is really one of, you know, it's been evolving, but it's often just an assessment of whether it's a green asset um, that's being financed and not a lot of ongoing review of is the asset actually having the green impact that the bond was intended to have. And so under Genesis 2, what you have is a digital data collection solution that's extracting data from the financed assets. And what that's used for is at the time of the bond issuance, you have the issuance of another instrument called an MOI. That's a mitigation outcome interest. That MOI is also a tradable instrument. It entitles the holder to the claims of the future emission reduction. So that's essentially a carbon credit, the ability to claim the impact by financing. And that claim gets settled over, over the vintages, over five years, 10 years with digital settlement. So the data that's being collected from the asset that's measuring um, emission reductions becomes then a, another product, an MOU, a mig mitigation outcome unit that settles the obligations under the MOI. So for a developer that's looking to build climate aligned assets, it's a source of financing. And for the holder, it's a highly visible instrument where not only do you get your emission reductions at the end of a process, but you can see the likelihood of receiving that because you're getting a constant data feed. So it's quite, you know, relative to what I've been doing for most of my career, waiting until the end of the year to see how many credits did I get? Was it, you know, was it 100% of what I expected? Was it 60%? Was it 110? It makes it very inefficient to plan and hedge. Um, whereas having a data feed ongoing and having the final product be data rich, it's just night and day in terms of value. So there's a lot of, this is not an obscure project with just tech innovators trying to move the market this way. There are many of the big banks, Bank of International Settlement, but commercial banks, debt capital markets teams, um, the UN, um, quite actively involved in this in this thesis, and and we're working on projects that will um, be taking advantage of this structure um, imminently. That is an amazing application, actually. To be honest, I've never heard of uh, this implementation using the blockchain technology, which makes it. Uh, I guess it will just ease the promises of governments into making them more applicable and easier to transact or to deal by the majority of the people or institutions worldwide beyond just boundaries, which is good. Okay, I guess uh, like the second point we would like to discuss is like, we all know the mining pr process using the proof of work uses a huge amount of renewable, uh, non-renewable energy and resources. And renewable energy can like solar energy, for example, and wind power, can significantly reduce the environmental impact. Why isn't there greater use of renewable energy in crypto mining in general? Or are there any limitations of using renewable energy when it comes to mining? I'll, I'll maybe take a take a shot at that. Um, I guess from my perspective, you know, working with a lot of developers in the renewable space, um, and then also working with mining companies, I think there's just a to some extent a uh, a time lag that you know the the industries haven't yet kind of created a rhythm between each other to coordinate on planning like i mentioned before to finance develop and finance a renewable asset you need to have a strong sense of where the demand is if not a contract in place and so you know in some ways if i look forward a few years and and i'm starting to see the beginnings of this renewable developers who then become you know, sort of as a as a I guess, I guess an appendage of their business, mining companies or mining companies that become renewable developers, that will allow a lot more efficient planning and coordination, and you'll see sort of a co development. Um, I don't, it, as I as I sort of see it, mining can take intermittent power um, uh, as opposed to some utility that needs to be on constantly. So that is a good fit for certain renewables. Um, yeah, so I, th I think we'll see more coordination and and, and better fit. There are limitations um, for sure, but but there are improvements and and directionally, I guess the in a sense the DNA of the renewable energy space, the environmental 
uh, asset development space and the crypto space are quite similar. Like they're very innovative. They're always trying to find solutions. They're trying to, you know, there's a bit of a, you know, ethos of making the world a better place, underpinning both those industries. And you are seeing coordination. So I think we'll see improvements over time. I, there, one of the articles you sent to us was, it was a Times article about a, a mining farm, for lack of a better term, using nothing but renewables in Texas, I think. Is that right? Is it Argo, Bill? Is that is that correct? I can't remember uh, the name of the yeah, I'm not. I'm not familiar with that article. I didn't. I didn't see that. But there are a number of uh, mining companies that use 100% renewables, and some of it's just dependent on where they are. If you're in Norway, you know, you kind of have no option to, but to use mostly renewables. And then, as you know, as I've seen it, there are yeah, there's there's Argo and you know, and Griffin and some others that um, Marathon that have been proactively moving into places where you've got more renewable. Uh, availability and and planning and and even in Asia, you know, I'm familiar with a few projects in Thailand that are looking to do the same. So that's the path of travel, the direction that I see um, in the space for sure. And it's also, I mean, the kind of the, the I mean, maybe a bigger question is why why aren't renewables more readily available for common use and general use, and how does policy play a role in kind of expediting the process for moving? the general population from carbon-based fuels to renewables that are that are lagging and we're not moving fast enough. We're not ne moving nearly fast enough. There's not that sense of urgency that is required to make that move. So the, I think this, that that's, in my opinion, the kind of the more interesting question is if we were more of a renewable-based society, that would answer the question in terms of you know where you get your power to kind of mine, et cetera. But that's a that's that's a bigger kind of policy slash innovation question. Yeah, I think I've read that that um, and I haven't done the analysis myself, so I'm not sure, but but that in terms of on the Bitcoin side, some over 50% is is on renewables now. And and I guess if you look across, you know, depending on where you are. Many, um, you know, whether it's households or commercial buildings or industrial factories, you know, that's that's probably comparable to what the where the industry is. So I, I don't think, you know, is sort that, of, Bill, does that include hydro? Are they including hydro in that? I would think to get to fifty. Yeah, that's that's correct. You, you'd hydro. have to you'd have to include hydro. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm this summer. I've been living in Germany, uh, where the Rhine is fast disappearing. So I'm not sure that that our our hydro is renewing at the rate that it uh, it needs to. But that's a that's a different conversation. And and to to Matt's point, uh, I, I'm not sure that mining is uh, come as you are kind of industry. It as, as we saw in terms of. Uh, changes that came about in government policy in China, um, mm. there was a, a significant migration across the globe yeah. of, uh, of, of mining. I think it really is a, um, uh, what you might have called in Washington, a kind of uh, venue shopping uh, industry. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, well, I'm just gonna like jump onto this point. Uh, I guess it's just what Bill mentioned earlier. It's just the mismatch between the two industries and different phases. I guess when it comes to uh, like sustainability and renewable energy and also blo blockchain development, these are like creative people trying to solve and driven by their values and ethos. But I think when it comes to like advocating this issue in the right places where you can make a political stance and difference, I guess we don't have the right people there that kind of see the difference or the sense of urgency yet. Because uh, a documentary or a kind of a short documentary just came out a couple of days ago by Vice News, actually, and they featured this specific subject. And they featured the senator, Ted Cruz, embracing the mining in Texas and how like selling this as a big thing and it's amazing. And like when was asked about the impact, the environmental impact, 
there was no sense of urgency in his reply. I and mean, it's not something that like kind of needs to be dealt with. Or is like really just yeah. I'm shocked by that. I guess. Well, holy my take. cow! Ted Cruz was not, <laughs> didn't express environmental concern. Oh my god! Yeah. It's, Anyhow, uh, I mean, we, this is we, we, to match your earlier point. We 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 wouldn't have a Clean Air Act, a Clean Water Act, an Occupational Safety and Health Act, an Endangered Species Act that took place in the early '70s. And actually, maybe there is even a, a more uh, a relevant point uh, around this that took place under a Republican president. So it is not that Ted Cruz is a Republican that is that we're we're even addressing i mean uh it, it, in fact happened. in fact the environmental protection agency was created by a republican it the, was. Na- the the uh, the 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 uh what's the review board the national environmental review board whatever that's called was created under nixon the clean water act was passed the clean air act so it's not I mean, and to speak to, I don't know, all the Republicans in China, maybe that's not such a big group. <laughs> but, uh, but, but whoever's going to hear this, it is not about Republican versus Democrat. It is not red versus blue. You gotta, you gotta really look at who the people you're supporting are and what they stand for, because not every Republican is like Ted Cruz on these issues. No, I was, I was focused on Ted Cruz specifically. Yeah. Yeah, I think, exactly. look, and I think part of it may be also a Texas thing. You know, I'm, I moved here from Hong Kong just about eight weeks ago. And, oh, wow. uh, you know, as I, uh, you know, so I can't speak with authority about the, the, the history and direction of, you know, kind of acceptance or, or support of renewables in, in Texas. But certainly from the conversations I'm having, there's, there are smiles and, and, and sort of maybe support in the idea, but, also a little bit of a snicker that look this is an oil and gas state and and i think that it's very deep in the you know i guess in the infrastructure but also in the psyche of you know texas that you know renewables is you know is maybe um okay here and there but we're plenty of oil and gas so let's charge forward and i think it'll take time for you know maybe texas to see some of the benefits of or you know embrace more widely the the benefits of renewables not just that it's lower carbon but lower um emissions you know respiratory you know related emissions um health so, costs yeah in a different topic or like building on the same one actually uh, other consensus mechanisms like proof of stake proof of history and proof of authority have a reduced environmental impact. Ethereum 2.0 will, will upgrade to proof of stake soon, perhaps in like less than a month, actually. Are there any other reasons that more and more protocols nowadays will follow suit and choose a different like uh, consensus mechanism that will have less environmental impact? Never is a word that makes everyone who says it uh, ultimately sound stupid. But but I but but I would venture to say that we will not we are not likely let's say to see more new proof of work startups coming into our uh, space. I've I've noticed, and I'm you know relatively new at this, but people want to be associated with green blockchain. I mean, in, in particularly in the you know clearly in the UN world, but I think in general. If you have a choice, you know, why wouldn't you, all things being equal, why wouldn't you choose something that is, you know, zero carbon? I mean, it doesn't, mm-hmm. it makes sense. And from a consumer point of view, from somebody, you know, innovators out there who are trying to build in this space, it just seems to me that that's going to happen more and more as we go. I and think it's not just true of the UN and public policy people who are in and around our space. We've just had a massive influx, massive influx of artists, yeah, NFTs, yeah. right? All yeah, of our sure. businesses are impacted by NFTs in 2021, 2022. Artists lead, uh, artists lead the revolution. I mean, they yeah. always have, right? Go back to the anti-fascist 
Picasso and Guernica. I mean, artists lead revolutions. Yeah. I think artists have come into our space with green values, pushing, uh, pushing all of us to make better choices. And, and I think we're, and, and we're better for it. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add, um, you know, just from some fundamentals perspective, um, you know, renewables in many markets, maybe it's becoming most markets are cost competitive, if not cheaper than other alternative, other energy sources. So there's kind of the value driver there um, in the finance space, the whether it's debt capital markets or equity providers have increasingly set stringent capital um, requirements that need to go into green assets. And so what that what that means is if you're trying to build something that's asset heavy, you're trying to build a business, you need financing, it's becoming increasingly hard to get that if you can't show that your business, what you're investing in, what you're building is environmentally friendly. So there's there's that kind of risk management side that you want to err in the greener direction to get access to finance. Then there's the policy, you know, over 297, I think, countries signed up to Paris Agreement, each of which have to set domestic carbon targets. So policy is becoming much more stringent around the carbon intensity of assets. You're seeing that significantly in the data center space where they're not only seeing that sort of push or, or constraint from a policy perspective and a finance perspective, but also from their customers um, demanding uh, you know, sort of carbon-free cloud services. And you know, crypto mining would be much the same. So when you know in the data center, there's a big push toward not just procuring renewable energy, but matching that on a time basis, matching that on an hourly basis. That's one of the solutions that you know we're we're deploying. And and um in doing that, they're securing renewable energy on a more stable, frequent basis, but they're also future proofing their business to get access to finance and, and to be, you know, essentially pre-compliant with ever stringent um, carbon constraints country by country. Bill's mention of 197 countries reminds me that one yeah. way to and it's not yeah, it's 197. One, yeah, one, that. one 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 way to look at the change that Ethereum is undergoing with the sort of Paris Accords as a, as, as a reference is that, that if you uh, assume the 99 to the fifth digit um, change is, is accurate, we'll, we're running consensus is financing a study of proof of stake Ethereum, which which we think will prove out ninety nine to the fifth digit uh, percent change virtually overnight, it means that we go from the carbon footprint of the Netherlands down a hundred and fifty countries in UN terms to the carbon footprint of Belize overnight. So uh, uh, we've dropped a hundred and fifty countries from being in the top 35 or so countries in terms of our carbon footprint to the bottom 15. And the, the rate of that change is remar remarkable. I mean, even the speed with yep. which, you know, Silvio Macaulay developed the pure proof of stake protocol in 2000, I think 18 or 17, maybe 17. Yep. yep. Not that long, not that long into in the evolution of, things in terms of, of of blockchain. So the rate of change is is remarkable. And that number that you just said, Steve, is pretty extraordinary. And that's that's incredible. That is true. This is one of the biggest uh, human experiments. And yeah. it's just interrelated. And like the, the the curve of learning between everyone, every participant, and like the improvement itself is just amazing to see. Because I guess in other industries or in other like societal aspects, you can't see this big change overnight. Or although it's not overnight, this shift from proof of work to proof of stake has been probably undergoing for almost four years. But still, like to just like pull off the plug overnight, and then you still have the same value or probably even more value generated to each users 
and probably it, it, to grow as well even better because it will be environmentally friendly and it will support more players that is just one of the biggest uh, experiments that have already that have been done in general so i guess we can uh, like discuss a little bit like about the like blockchain technology can positively impact the environmental industry beyond the use of cleaner energy and more sustainable consensus mechanisms how can blockchain technology help with environmental issues i guess this is something that uh, you all like have plenty of uh, experience and issues that you can share with us we all do but let's start with matt because matt actually raised it earlier uh, some of the um some of the very positive and and really uh, leading work that that algorand's undertaken in the space yeah for sure and maybe just to your to the early, earlier point about the rate of change you know in i think the wright brothers flew in 1909 and then Lindbergh crossed the atlantic in 1927 25 maybe and once he crossed the atlantic the aviation industry went like this because mm. people saw the practical use of flying, right? And so they understood the technology was beneficial to them. And I think in the, as we prove out these use cases and as we show the rapid rate of change within the technology itself to greener and more environmentally friendly, um, that I think more and more people will begin to build on it, will, will be involved and, and the adoption will increase, maybe not as fast as what happened after Lindbergh, but, but pretty fast. Anyway, yeah, so, you know, um, you know, sensors, uh, uh, funding a, a startup out of MIT called TRAM, which tokenizes behavior, getting people to, instead of, and starting with college kids, which is the right demographic, instead of taking the bus, you take the train. Instead of taking the train, you ride a bike. Instead of riding a bike, you do this. And you're 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 rewarded. And then that those rewards are aggregated in tokens and sold as carbon offsets. Um, you know, uh, traceability on with supply chain issues is a really big one. Proving the provenance of a product that someone purports to be green or organic, having confidence built up among consumers and regulators, knowing where the, you know what that provenance really is, irrefutably. Uh, the sharing of data, um, you know, uh, in terms of environmental studies, particularly when it comes to oceans, instead of being siloed, you know, everybody can see it; it's transparent. There, these are, you know, just some of the use cases that we're funding at Algorand. And again, as we tell these stories, as more people understand the power of the underlying technology, not to say that the technology itself is transformative, but the application of it can be transformative. I think, um, you know, we're going to see more and more of this and, you know, Bill invests and, and we invest and uh, the ideas that come before us are just incredible and it gives gives me faith it's actually it gives me hope that we are going to be better than what we've been um because uh you know all of it is all of it is here ready for us to build on it and we just need to prove it invest it and keep the faith yeah I, I, uh, on that um on that traceability point um you know it's it's a very it's not a I guess just a, a nice to have or, or or a gimmick. It's you know we're seeing from you know very large consumer goods corporates that operate in Asia as they're supplying product to Europe in particular, they are getting hit very hard with requirements to prove and and do that in a very traceable, verifiable way that the products they are bringing into Europe have a you know a certain carbon footprint ideally zero but they need to evidence what that looks like and the cost um, related to any residual carbon um in you know depending on which product line it is you know it's crazy. upwards of 80 well, ours, euros a ton so, um, so that's you know that's very real it's it's you know for in the consumer goods space the need to efficiently reliably um demonstrate what the carbon intensity is of a product and ideally get on the front foot and mitigate that before you show up at the border in Europe is 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 becoming very a very acute issue for very large consumer goods corporates um and then you know maybe just remarking on on the, the topic in question i you know i mentioned before that like in my in my view and my career 
driving financing into climate aligned assets is one of the most important aspects of how we're going to address climate change, getting the right types of projects financed, getting that capital to find those projects and, and then yeah, allowing that capital to see the evidence that it's actually done done its job. So I think that, you know, in my view, a really, really important part of how blockchain is playing a role is both in terms of really effective um, instruments to get access to climate aligned finance opportunities to get capital into those assets, but then also on that traceability, the measurability, the ability to then reference that three years later. You know, today, when you've got a carbon credit uh, or historically, and you may have a document or a contract, a sale and purchase agreement, if you're asked to evidence, you know, that you've actually reduced emissions a couple of years later, you're fumbling around for documents and purchase contracts and registries. Whereas today, you know, your carbon accounting books can, you know, essentially be accessed mm -hmm. and referenced with product being digitally available through permission to access. So it's, it's a much easier sort of story to build on the front end and a much easier story to reference on the back end. What I see uh, happening uh, from my vantage point that's 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 very very exciting, very and it has it has uh, and and we're trying to play a uh, a role of convener in this is uh, if if NFTs were the uh, were the focal point of blockchain, a a, a maybe a major, maybe the major in some ways focal point of blockchains in 2021 and early 22 i'm seeing community now as the equivalent focal point for 2022 2023 in this as matt refer referenced correctly this sort of fast paced uh, evolving uh, technology i think we will we're entering a, a year in which community will be a theme as important as nfts were last year and earlier this year communities in reference to DAOs, but not only in reference to DAOs, communities uh, in reference to, to governments the the g in the esg mm -hmm. but but communities uh, around the greening of our own industry and in that regard um there are extensive conversations going on that i'm really quite uh, proud to see taking place uh, in our community, in our Ethereum community, about needing to address the historic carbon footprint, the seven years of proof of work doesn't go away just because we've moved to proof of stake. The impact that was had on the planet is, uh, is, is one for which uh, I'm happy to say the community is beginning to take responsibility and working groups are being formed to figure out how to bring innovation to solutions to address that seven-year carbon debt. Interestingly, just as an, uh, 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 aside, an aside here, the same seven years as the Paris Accord. In fact, Ethereum was created in mid 2015 as were the paris accords and indeed around themes of trust and alignment and the end of financial duplicity they have very similar ideas running through them there was at the outset of ethereum and the paris accords a kind of intellectual alignment which i'm beginning to see reemerge. Yeah, and did maybe just quickly to add to that, from from what I see of those, you know, conversations in the community and 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 you know early developments of activity is, it's not a conversation that says look we have a particular you know historic carbon impact let's let's see if we can mitigate that in some way. It's actually much wider conversations around you know being motivated by that history. How can we make a very Do that and more forward. yeah exactly and it's a very forward-looking very expandable sort of sort of conversation around how do we become you know a solution that's much larger than you know maybe some of the history that we we were involved with 
Yeah. And you look at the community, as you said, see the community members, like the Algorand community, the ideas and passion they have to bring that they bring to this. It's just, it's just, and it's just going to grow and grow and grow. There's no question in my mind, but again, that's, that's what gives me hope. That is true. And it all uh, like brings hope to the whole industry in general, because as uh, both all of you actually mentioned, it's not just about the past seven or 10 years of uh, carbon emission caused by, for example, Ethereum, but it's just about the ethos that like underline the whole uh, movement or the whole network. And it's about like going beyond that and making a difference, which is amazing. And the power of blockchain can like, as you mentioned, like tokenizing impact, it's not just something that we will promise we will do. And probably it will be done, but not like half done. And it's very hard to measure the impact. Now it's like very different. To some extent, you have like probably like 90 or even more visibility about the impact of like any players that or instrument or project that you are financing or tracking in terms of the impact on the environment and like improvement that they have made so this is something that like we would like to see in the future in terms of like how these blockchains or projects or protocols have went beyond just what they have used in terms of like environmental uh impact or damage but also fix other issues out there in society and like without boundaries or like that is something amazing and of course algorand as you mentioned matt it's like the work boy in the whole list we all know that algorand is always driven by the mission of like being good in terms of like having the least impact 100 percent renewable or less environment negative impact adam i think you've wrapped this up beautifully no, I haven't. I was just adding some of my points, but I would love to hear your point actually about how can all of these players work together to achieve this, this vision of having a, like greener blockchains or greener distributed ledgers or crypto. It just, just depends on how different players call it or name it. But like, I guess all of these people who are really working towards making a difference in the whole industry are driven by these missions financial inclusive uh, inclusion uh, sustainability less like uh, like positive impact in general so how can like please share your point of views and and i know um we're coming up on time so just to be very brief um i in my view you know the community and certainly in the Ethereum community, but as I see in the wider crypto community, there's there is a lot of coordination and and there's a lot of self criticism. There's you know there's there's a lot of um, I guess testing of ideas and thesis. And I, as I mentioned before, the the ethos of the community is to innovate, improve, and that that goes quite hand in hand with environmental the ethos of the environmental movement. And and so. You know how can these industries coordinating? I think they are, and you know that that growing sort of, I guess, understanding that they need to coordinate environmental, you know, uh, finance, environmental impact, and crypto. Um, you know, there's a there's a growing awareness, and it's happening. So I think, um, you know, I'm not sure how to do it better. It's just yes, you know, over time, it's happening, um, and we'll see more and more of it. And as we see very you know significant successful cases of that happening more more of it will happen uh, so i think it's just kind of on the you know the the balls rolling toward you know a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy of the industries are working together and they'll increasingly do so Hopefully. and what i'm seeing in the um in the community efforts uh in particular as i said around uh ethereum and what comes next after the transition it is beautiful it is a it's a meeting it's become this conversation's become a meeting place for ngos igos um, technologists uh, uh, business finance it's it's uh, it, it, it's a beautiful coalition and consortium i think that's coming together to to drive um, environmental change in our industry and it we are just at the outset yeah and it, i mean to echo you guys but just it's just the it's it's just a, it's a quality it's like a quality of imagination 
within our ecosystem and our community that looks at the world you know, as it as it could be. And I think understanding how technology can get us there. But that that quality of imagination applied with this technology to advance change, again, I think is unstoppable and it's going to continue to grow and grow. And it's a good place to be. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. That was an amazing discussion. And uh, you have all enlightened us with your visions and also perspective, which is really good to see and grasp and gave us also a lot of hope as well. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Matt. That was amazing. And thank, thank you. you to our and thanks to BSN and Red Date. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Adios. Cheers.